You know, I am so sorry. I forgot to hit the record button. Oh, no. So let's just call that as a first run through. Okay. And rehearsal. So you, you've heard my fascinating introduction, but I'll say it again. So it's actually recorded. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Fair Folk at Work. You know, I've interviewed a lot of people and talked to a lot of people about FAIR, and what everybody remembers about the FAIR is the avalanche of sound that was enveloping you as you went there. It could be a parade, it could be a stage show with singing and dancing, or it could be a lady just sitting under a tree strumming her mandolin. My guest today is Morgan McDowell, and she has spent the last 40 years contributing to that tapestry of sound. So welcome, Morgan. Thank you very much, Dan. I'm so glad to be part of this program. Thank you so much for being here and being so musically giving to the world. But before we get into the music of the fair, I'd like to find out a little bit more about you and start you off with the traditional Fair Folk at Work first question, which is, how did you hear about this thing called fair, and what did they say to get you out there? Well, I first heard about the Renaissance Fair in 1968, uh, when I was all of 11 years old. I understand that that was the first year at the Agoura site. I grew up in Southern California in Inglewood. I'm sure there was a lot of outreach in the community at the time and a lot of free passes given out. And my mom got some of those passes through her work. And my mother and my grandmother and I trooped off to the Renaissance Fair. Let me add, I was raised to be an Anglophile by a family of Anglophiles. Uh, one of my first memories is my mother reading to me from the Jungle Books, Kipling's Jungle Books. So Kipling, Peter Pan, Shakespeare, all that stuff was very big in my household. So off we went to the Renaissance Fair. I don't know what she was expecting. Probably like some kind of large Shakespeare production or something. She definitely wasn't expecting the California Hippie Fair, which is what it was at that point. And she and my grandmother were a little nonplussed by the whole thing, but I was in love. The sights, the sounds, the smells just assaulted me. And it was wonderful. I bought a string of love beads from a real hippie and showed them off to my friends probably till they were sick of it for weeks afterwards. Do you Several remember any shows or specific things? No, it's all a pastiche at this point. What I remember distinctly was that there was a queen show and that there was a Queen Elizabeth, but good Lord, that was 55 years ago. So I don't remember very much from that first fair, just the emotional hit that I got from it, that this was a wonderful place. And so three years later in 1971, when I was 14, I was working with a small theater group in the Inglewood Torrance Hawthorne area. And our director said one day, we're going to take this act to the Renaissance Fair. And I was very happy to hear this because, yes, I get to go back to the Renaissance Fair. That was cool. Uh, what was the <laughs> act that you took out there? We were doing story theater that first year, acting out fairy tales, basically. And we had some pretty witty guys in the show, so it was always very interesting. I was drafted as the musician for this theater troupe because I played the guitar. So we did that one year. The next year we did like a mystery play with giant puppets. These were 18 foot tall puppets. They were huge, but that only went on for the one year. That particular theater company, the Genesis Darte Theater Company, only went out there for two years. And by that point, I was thoroughly hooked. So I came back the next year, that would have been 73, as unnamed peasant number 7,322. 
And I got myself hooked up with the people who were starting to do the Queen's Court. A gentleman by the name of Patrick Duffy was directing. Patrick Duffy was a character. And little me from the wrong side of the tracks who had been pretty well protected and cosseted in my young life, got out here and meeting very flamboyant, shall we say, characters like Patrick Duffy and David Springhorn and all that cast of characters. And not only that, but I'm working with these people. They're directing me in this show. So I worked myself up from servant to noble, making my own costumes, because as a poor kid, that's the only way I could do it. Who taught uh, you to sew? My mother taught me to sew when I was 10. My mother taught me the things that have, that have gotten me the most jobs in my life, and that's cooking and sewing. <laughs> Sad, but there it is. Can I interrupt for a sec? Go ahead. Do you remember what Patrick or David taught you as directions? Another way to phrase it is, what did they explain to you what they were trying to do at the fair? It was less about explaining what to do than showing you what to do, especially with David Springhorn. Patrick Duffy kind of liked to wind things up and let them go and let you know when you did something wrong. <laughs> also, the one thing I learned from Patrick Duffy was this deathless line. When one of the cast members had left his shoes in L.A., this was at Northern Fair, all he had was hush puppies. And Patrick Duffy looked down from his great height as the Earl of Oxford and said to my friend, if they look at your feet, there's something wrong with your face. There you have it. Words to live by. Do you remember similar pearls of wisdom from David? Or in observing David, what did you sort of pick up on as the gestalt of the fair? Anything goes. Okay. That there is a framework to work with inside, but inside of that framework, you can do whatever your imagination can come up with. I think that's a nicest tribute I think I've heard to David and I've heard a lot of them. And I think that also incorporates my general critique of the fair was that there was a general framework. But pretty much within that framework, you could basically do what you want, right? Yes. And it was it was really a case of benign neglect. As long as the entertainment director was okay with you. And remember, the entertainment director for the heyday of that period was Peg Long, who played the queen. As long as she was okay with it, you were good. So in 1998, continuing our narrative here, I got involved with a group that was going to put on a noble sword fight. The name of this show was Counterpoint. Only happened one year. And what were some of the names of the people associated with Counterpoint? Glad Pickering, uh, Sean Hannon. Sean Hannon was our prince. Corey Steinberg, Michael Colty. Michael Colty's still doing it there. He was one of the sword fighters in the Counterpoint show. He got killed every day. He got stabbed. We had a blood pack and everything. It was really gory. What was your role? I was the prince's mistress. I was the Italian countess. And we just flitted around the fair all morning until it was time for this sword fight. We flitted in and out of the English court, caused a big ruckus because we do outrageous things because we were Italians. We were the first Italian court at the fair, by the way. All Italians that came later, we were the first. The Italian prince and I would have, you know, screaming matches in the middle of the fair. And then at noon, there would be this sword fight with, of course, the English guy always won. But then at that point, all we Italian courtiers changed our clothes. So I got to change my clothes and put on peasant clothes and just run around with the peasants for the rest of the day. And that's when I fell in with the country dance hippies. That's when I discovered the English country dancers. God bless them. Doug Berger, 
and Patty Blanco and the group that really had no name at that point. They called themselves the Caca Fuego Dancer. <laughs> at the time, I was at my day job, was working for a woman who had a booth at the fair. She had a clothing booth. The booth was called Moresca. And she still does fairs on the East Coast. So, hi, Lena, if you're ever listening to this. Thanks for everything. What's Lena's last name? Lena Dunn, D-U-N. And she, oh my goodness, she designed beautiful clothes. And it was also around that time that I moved from the Los Angeles area up to Northern Sonoma County to be part of the Cloverdale Collective where Bob Thomas, Edwin Ellis, uh, I think Ricker was living there at the time, David Ricker, a bunch of the fair artsy people lived. And Lena was going up to be part of that uh, arts community. And I tagged along and I lived in town. I didn't live in the actual artist's conclave up at the top of the hill in Cloverdale. But I was part of the, the social element for that. And that's where I really got to know uh, Don Brown, Bob Thomas, David Ricker, that whole crowd. Can I stop you for a second? Yes. I'm looking for a theme to your interactions at the fair. And I'm getting a lot of dance and music. And I'm wondering, how did dealing with people one-on-one, -on -one, selling them something at a booth, contrasted or compared to performing on the stage? Well, I never worked at a booth on the weekend. I was sewing during the week for the booth. I never dealt, dealt with customers in that, in that way. No, 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 no. Did you <laughs> interact verbally with customers at the fair or was it more in a performance dance music joy? I kind of liked interacting with the customers, even if it's a Goji Gaden, oh, look at that pretty baby, that kind of thing. I didn't have a lot of gigging in the street because I'm not as quick-witted as others, shall we say. And it wasn't really my gig, but I always liked interacting with people in my Elizabethan persona. What was your Elizabethan persona once you are no longer the mistress to the Italian Mistress to the Italian Prince of Mantua. Oh, no, I was just, just a regular uh, peasant, but I was learning English country dance. And I was learning the tunes that went with the English country dance. Do you remember the first English country dance that you did that you said, this is a lot of fun. I want to do more of this. I danced with the English country dancers as my Italian countess persona after the, the first couple of weeks of that fair when I really fell in with these people and started learning these dances. The dance they were teaching at the time turned out to be a, <clears throat> an American square dance that they learned from Richard Chase. Richard Chase, put a pin in that. I want to come back to that later. Turned out to be uh, an Appalachian square dance. Oops. And it was called Grand Square. And we did it to the tune of Newcastle. And after that, we learned, oops, that's not even English. Maybe we shouldn't be doing that anymore. But that was the first dance I did. It was called Grand Square. And it made the, the dance, the figures, it all made sense to me immediately. I was desperate for more. I just started picking up the country dances after that. And the year after that, Patty Blanco and I broke from Doug Berger. That's a unfortunate personal episode, and I don't really want to get into that right now. But Patty Blanco and I broke from, uh, shall we call them the Caca Fuego dancers, and formed our own troupe, uh, which we called the Merry Franksters. Bob Thomas had a couple of things to say about that, but oh well. The Merry mm -hmm. Franksters are still going, I'd like to, to tell you. They're going along in Davis. I don't have anything to do with them now, but God bless them. They're still going strong. Who um, came up with the name Mary's Pranksters and what was the genesis of that naming? I was living in Ojai in Patty Blanco's house and we were putting together this dance troupe. And my good friend Bruce Dick would come up and spend weekends and he at the time was reading the electric Kool-Aid acid test. And we were, um, can I say that? This, we were getting high. 
And we said, what if we called ourselves Merry Pranksters, except M E R R I E P R Y A N, like, you know, Elizabethan E. <laughs> and we laughed and we laughed and then we did it. We made a big sign the next weekend when everybody was coming up for a dance rehearsal that said, Oh, hi, welcomes Mary Prankster. What for one of the original acid dance to it was Rio Hondo welcomes Mary Prank. Anyway, it was a big in joke. Yeah, Bob Thomas had a few things to say to us, but. Uh, in what way were you thinking of distinguishing yourself from other fair dance acts? Not peasant. We were going for more a middle class look. Uh, we were also going for a more theatrical presence. We started out with like little couplets before dances. And at one point we got on to full on silly little plays, but we wanted to be more middle class, present our costumes as more middle class. I had a lot to do with that. So you're going for, it sounds like a more theatrical presentation involving words and dance and music to tell a larger story exactly we would occasionally stop everything and burst into very naughty rounds do you remember any of those naughty rounds to this day i remember all of them what which round was I'll, I'll, always a crowd pleaser i'll give you a piece of a very long three-part catch this piece was on the back of the handouts that Mitchell Sandler gave out one year for his Songs and Catches workshop, but never actually worked on this piece because it was A, so long, and B, so filthy. This is featured on my band camp album, Courtly Manners, Country Matters. So here comes part one of My Man John. My man John had a thing that was long. My maid Mary had a thing that was heavy. My man John put his thing that was long into my maid Mary's thing that was hairy. A thing that was hairy. A thing that was hairy. My man John put his thing that was long into my mad Mary's thing that was hairy and it goes on from there i i can imagine <laughs> that was and there was celia upon this when celia was learning on the spin to play her tutor stood by her to show her to show her to show her to show her the way which is an elizabethan catch and the funny bits come in the holes it's right. to show her a long trip. To show her a long trip. To show her, yeah, those body old Elizabethans. So how did you get dancers for this budding ensemble? Some of the dancers from the old troupe came with us. And we just happened to like grab people we know and say, hey, we're going to do this. And they're all, oh, yeah, we want to do that too. Uh, I remember my friend Bruce just kind of like grabbed a couple of women and brought them over. And we ended up with a good crew for our first year. And it just grew from there. Now, in 1980, I was privileged to be a part of the Britain trip as part of the Devon America 400th anniversary of Drake's circumnavigation of the globe. A bunch of us went to Britain. The LHC paid half of it. And my family, God bless them, came up with the rest of it. And we went and we performed in Britain. We basically did a condensed queen show at the National Theatre in London. Who was your queen? Louisa. Louisa, to my mind, is the best and most authentic Elizabeth we have ever had. A small bird-like woman with a presence and a voice to fill the universe. She was so good and such a sweet woman. Oh my God, I love Louisa. Anyway, yes, Louisa was our queen. Will Wood, of course, was Sir Francis Drake. 
Mitchell Sandler and I were there to provide musical accompaniment. Doug Berger was playing the Spanish ambassador. And of course, Phyllis was there. And Brian went, he was about 10. And Kevin went, he was an older teenager at that point, I think. Lynn Ann Berger, it was completely amazing. We did a show in Drake's home uh, right off of Dartmoor that was transcendent. It was just amazing. In the same room with freaking Drake's drum, okay? Wah! After we came back, I was offered a job at the LHC costume department, which I had been kind of angling for for a couple of years. So then I was working for the costume department during the week and working for entertainment on the weekend. And let me tell you, it was a sweet gig. <laughs> Did you work with Chris Zeta? Chris Zeta came on when I had been working there for a while. Yes, Chris Zeta was a good friend of mine, and I, I adore her to this day. But my boss, when I first started working, was Carolyn Schultz, the woman who wrote the book on Elizabethan and Dickensian costume, along with uh, Janet Winter. So Carolyn Schultz was my boss. And the first thing we did was we started working on the Drake show. You saw the boat. The boat was constructed for was this sound and light show, which I think uh, got into Phyllis's head when we were in Britain, that this was something that she wanted to do. So we did uh, the Drake show and I, oh my goodness, I triple dipped that show. My band at that point with Mitchell Sandler and, and Doran Sherwin, who are both hotshot European early musicians at this point. God bless them. I love those guys. So I had this band with Mitchell and Doran, and we went into the studio and we recorded all the music for the Drake show. I was also a performer in the Drake show and a musical performer for the dinner show beforehand as well as costuming it. It didn't get good reviews, but geez, it was a lot of fun. Never happened again, but I think that's more because of the robbery that happened uh, the next Southern Fair than anything else. But that's somebody else's tale for another day. But I was on the crew when that happened and it was, uh, it was not good. So eventually, I think it was 83, 1983, when things had gotten to such a point with the LHC that it, I was working on the crew at that point for the, the Fox Theater Dickens Fair and it took them six months to get my final paycheck to me. At which point I had been evicted out of my home for non-payment and got really mad at them. And I swore I would never darken their door again. This is too much. You can't do this to me. And tried to make my way in the real world. Well, I'm here to tell you the real world sucks. Ted Avery and I, have you interviewed Ted Avery yet? No, I haven't. I hope you do. She, she has a lot of insight as well. She and I used to always say that the Renaissance Fair was the best thing that ever happened to me, slash it damn near ruined my life. And that second part, was because so many of us have had a really difficult time adapting to the real world. And I don't think it was the fair. I don't say that anymore. I don't add that second part anymore because I am pretty sure that it was the non-neurotypicalness on perhaps all of our parts, or maybe just those of us that got so deeply involved in the fair because it was a place where we could thrive, where our non-diagnosed, non-neurotypical problems were overlooked and our strengths were celebrated and added to. I think that's 100% correct. I'd like to switch gears here for a moment okay. and talk about you and music. Can you remember the first musical instrument you ever played and what was it? Oh, well, it, it was piano. When I was a very, very small child, they tell me even before I was talking, 
I was harmonizing with TV commercials and singing along with TV themes and the like. I don't come from a very musical family. My mother, bless her, had a completely gin ear, but she loved music. So when it was evident that I had a musical talent, bam, she slapped me into piano lessons at age six. And that that was a useful thing. You know, you can get a, a keyboard. There's a visual sense of intervals because it's right there in literal black and white under your fingers. But as somebody with ADD and attendant learning disability, my particular learning disability is dyscalculia which not only screws me up for numbers, but screws me up for reading Western music notation. So I've never been very good with that, but my ear is very good. If I hear something once or twice, I can usually reproduce it. Do you remember the first time you were sitting at the keyboard and you realized as you were making sounds with your fingers and they had a relationship to the keyboard where it all sort of came together for you and you kind of figured out what was going to happen next? No, I think I was too young. And lessons always happened on Saturday morning. And I wanted to be out playing with my friends. I didn't want to be playing, didn't taking piano dumb lessons. When music came alive for me, honestly, it was when I discovered the Beatles and started playing a guitar. This was like age 10, 11, maybe. Again, Anglophilia. And do you remember which Beatles songs you first became familiar with enough to fall in love with music? The genesis of my Beatle mania was seeing Yellow Submarine and all of the songs from Yellow Submarine are, are still very, very, very dear to me. And even the little snippets of things that happen in Yellow Submarine. There's a snippet of Bach's Air on the G-String, thanks to Sir George Martin. I'm completely sure, in the Sea of Monsters. So I had to find out what was that snippet that they used in the Sea of Monsters. Well, it was Bach, Air on the G-String. And, you know, like an obsessed ADD teenager, I found out everything I could. I picked up the guitar. I figured out the chords. When I started to, listening to Led Zeppelin several years later, my mother looks at me and says, whatever happened to those nice Beatles? Let me ask kind of the same question, only change Beatles to Renaissance Fair music. What was the song that sort of said, okay, this is where I want to spend 40 or five years of my life? It was uh, Six Wives of Henry VIII and Elizabeth R. and David Monroe and the Early Music Consort of London. As a baby musician, I was, you know, singing in school choirs and church choirs and because, you know, that's what you do when you're a baby musician. And I had learned that I really liked the 16th century, century repertoire, whatever it was, Palestrina, Gabrielli, the Madrigals, whatever they were, the structure of the chords and the inner movement of the music, which I later found is called polyphony. Renaissance polyphony is just a wonderful thing. It gets me on a real visceral level and it always has. It always seemed very familiar and very poignant to me, even when I was a child. I'd like to switch gears here for a little bit and talk about your skills as a person who puts together music and dance shows and what in your estimation goes into putting together a decent set for the renaissance fair well the first thing you need to do is you need to find really good people and then you'll let them go my theory of, of band direction at the renaissance fair who are some of the good people that I'm not asking for necessarily the greatest people you've ever played with, but who have you played and performed for that have given you the most joy? The late, great, lamented Avis Minger was my strong right arm 
for many, many years. I miss her so terribly. She was such a, a fine fiddle player and a really strong player. You know, you got to be a strong, loud player at the fair. You can't just be playing quietly. No, no. You got to be, you, you, you make a mistake, you make it loud. <laughs> and then do it again so it sounds like you meant it. You, you got to be a certain type of musician to make it at the Renaissance Fair. And you can't be shy and you can't be re retired. <laughs> and I, you know, Avis was one. Mitchell Sandler, of course. Carvin, Carvin Knowles. Carvin Knowles is a university educated early musician from the University of Oklahoma, whose professor said to him, if you want to play this early music in context, you got to go to the Renaissance Pleasure Fair in California. So he did. And what a fabulous musician. What fun to play with him. Mitchell Sandler, Doran Sherwin. Oh, God, I don't remember Miriam's last name. It was so long ago. I remember Avis. She had dark hair and was sort of short. When she wasn't playing, she was incredibly quiet. She loved the, the English music. She played for uh, Berthley Morris just, you know, when she was at home. Uh, so she just, she played music all the time. She definitely wasn't there for the party. You know, Avis never drank anything stronger than root beer and certainly never did the substances the rest of us <laughs> she was a, a little spacey a little forgetful and she'd be sitting up with us when we were passing a reefer and somebody would forget and pass it to her and she'd look at you and she said really you don't want me on that <laughs> and she'd pass it off. oh i miss her so much she was such a fine musician i was able to see and sit with her just before she died so i'm, I'm glad i got to do that God, I miss her. Let me change the focus of that question. Say you have to give me a five-song show of songs that have made you happy to perform and or show to somebody. Okay. Okay. This is this is from my my Renaissance Fair musical variety show that I always wanted to see, where you've got court dancers, country dancers, and musical acts. Okay, you start out with a big country dance scent, like uh, Match on a Creek, which is a, a great vigorous dance with eight couples with everybody spinning around. And then you have a singer come out and with a band and do the song Renner Dine about a shape-shifting fox. And then you have the court dancers come out and they do La Spagnoletta, which is a lovely twirly, elegant court dance. And then you have their singers come out and do a beautiful court madrigal, say, El Grillo, about how the cricket and how he sings so beautifully. And then we end this up with big dance for everybody, where everybody does a country dance and let's make it gathering pesquets. Can you think about what musicians you would like to have be the band? Oh, my super band? Yeah. Musicians living and dead. Okay. Avis, Doran, Mitchell, Carvin. I'd have Kevin Fanning on drums. Uh, he was one of the Bruno drummers. And a, a, a recorder section of Stacy Toy and Judy Walker on Hammer Dulcimer. My goodness. And there's a name I haven't thought of for. Oh, she was really, really nice. Wasn't she just the sweetest person you've ever met? Oh, my goodness. And Bruno made it a point when she was still playing recorder because she was so easily amused. They'd she, make a point to, like, goof off and joke right in front of her so she'd be playing recorder, tweedle, 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 tweedle. tweedle, 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 tweedle. And I remember yeah. Stacy Toy. Playing recorder. Right. A small woman, long, dark hair, glasses, she wore a, one of those crocheted Roxanne hats. We she, all wore those crochet Roxanne hats. She, switching gears once again, um, I've been told at Black Point there was sort of this tension between using strictly period tunes as opposed to people 
adapting or even writing just new songs that were more appealing to a modern era. Can you talk to me about that? Well, there was a lot of that, actually, because a lot of the country dance tunes, they are bloody boring to play day after day, week after week, year after year. Oh, if I hear that tune again, I'm going to scream. What are we going to do? And those are the ones that go on like really, really long. So there's a English folk singer by the name of Martin Carthy. And Martin Carthy, who is one of my folk idols, plays fast and loose with a lot of English folk music. He takes this lyric here and he sticks it with this melody here and he takes this melody and he sticks it here and he makes a whole new song and it's wonderful. So I took that as permission to do whatever the hell I wanted to. And there was one in particular, Greenwood. Greenwood is the name of the dance and it's a very long dance. And there's only one stanza of tunes for this dance. And it goes on forever. And I'd had it to hear. I said, okay, I'm changing this. And I took a tune by His Majesty King Henry VIII and adapted it and wrote a new B part. And we used that and everybody loved it and lived happily ever after. And never had to hear the other tune again. Stacy Toy did the same thing with the tune for a dance called Boatman. It was a stupid tune. It was just stupid no 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 we're gonna do something completely different she wrote a tune that went uh but up but it's a great tune everybody loved it and lived happily ever after when you're and i'm putting this in quotation marks adapting an earlier piece to make it more entertaining for you to play? Yes. What constraints do you feel about being period unauthentic versus being entertaining to you and a modern audience? And how do you balance that? Well, there's got to be a balance. For one thing, actual authentic stringed instruments are never going to reach the back of the hall without some kind of uh, electric intervention. So you've got to have a steel stringed modern instrument to really play loud, which is the name of the game at the fair, playing loud. This is my octave mandolin. I can call it a citern, which is an actual early instrument, but it's not a citern because it has, you know, modern machine heads and steel strings. There was no technology to make those back in the day. I had one little old man come up to me at a morning street set. I'm playing away on my octave mandolin. And this little guy, he's got a sheaf of, of music in one hand. He's in a tunic and a little, little hat. And he's got a recorder in the other. And he kind of sidles up to me and he says, nice machine head you got on that citern there. And I said to him, you and me know that and nobody else. And I'm not telling if you won't. But actual early instruments, except for the wind instruments, you, you can't play them on stage at the Renaissance Fair. They will never be heard unless you're amplified. And we didn't do that back then. So how do you feel about microphone music acts on stage at the fair? I don't like it personally I think it really breaks the illusion and the illusion is what we're trying to sell so if you're going to break it that badly I mean why not have food trucks oh sorry yeah yeah I caught um, that I caught that yeah so getting back to the balance when you're composing and you have sort of a boring original tune this is weird to express as a question but how boring do you allow yourself to be on the quest to be authentic versus how modern a chord structure or whatever you're gonna aim for to make the modern audience go "Ooh, nice tune 
Well, it's got to be in the confines of the dance. You've got to make it fit the dance. That's rule number one. It must fit the dance. Brian Del Army. Oh, I forgot Brian. Brian Del Army is one of the great musicians I've worked with. Brian Del Army once said that in English country dance, the tune and the dance are married. They have the same name. They are the same. The tune must reflect the dance. The dance must reflect the tune. I guess it's like the, the whole Renaissance Fair. You're working within a particular framework of AA, BBB. You've got a set and turn here. You're going to uh, do a turn and a half and lead out here. And the music has to follow that. With the Greenwood tune, I started with a tune that was already an early tune. Uh, King Henry's The Hunt Is Up. And then added a string of notes that worked right with the dance form for the B. Because I had to make up a B. Because there was only that one part of The Hunt Is Up. That's all there is. But because I had been working within the framework for so long, it was a pretty easy job. So you sort of get a sense of what the whole thing should look like. So what the whole thing should sound like. You just sort of cram whatever in kind of makes it work and yes. makes everybody happy. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yes. Dancers and musicians. Again, this is shifting gears quite a bit. There can often be moments of tension when artistic visions collide. What have you learned are good coping skills and how to get past difficulties in interpersonal slash artistic communications that you have found useful in your life? Artistic endeavors need to be a benevolent dictatorship. You've got to have somebody with the vision and people who are willing to work with the person with the vision to make that happen. But somebody's got to have the final yes, no, we're doing this, we're not doing that. If you do that by committee, it's gonna take too long and it's gonna dilute the vision. When my late husband and I were running a band in the 90s, it was the same thing. You know, it's it's got to be the people with the vision and the people willing to help do that vision. You can't have too many prima donnas. But a benevolent dictatorship where you, yes, you will listen to what people have to say, and then you will make your decision. And the, that decision will be acted upon. Well, yeah, in, in an artistic endeavor, yeah, you can't have too many cooks. It'll be bad. So uh, I want to go back to the Richard Chase thing. Our tradition of English country dance and Morris dance in our little Renaissance Fair world is in fact a real living tradition of Morris and English country dance going back from teacher to student to Cecil Sharp himself in the 19th century. And this is how that works. Cecil Sharp was a teacher and a folklorist during the last great folk revival of the 19th century. And he's the one that wrote all of this down. There are volumes and volumes of country dance and Morris books edited by Cecil Sharp and Maud Carples. So Cecil Sharp was an educator and had a young American in one of his classes named Richard Chase. Richard Chase then graduated, went back home, wrote many studious academic folklore books, some about the American Jack Tales. He studied in Appalachia, picked up dances and songs there, picked up dances and songs from England, settled in Ontario, California, where one of his friends was Phyllis Patterson. Phyllis Patterson says to Richard Chase at one point, oh, I'm putting together this Renaissance Fair thing. Could you put together some English dancers for me? So Richard Chase goes to, I guess, the local high school and scares up a bunch of kids by the name of Doug Berger, Patty Blanco, several others who no longer do fair. 
and started teaching them English country dance and Morris dance. And from Patty Blanco and Doug Berger to me, to the rest of the world. So teacher to student, we go all the way back to Cecil Sharp. We do what's called sharp siding in English country dance, which is a technical thing. We also do a thing called zesty English country dance. If you went to an E English folk dance and song society, English country dance in say the mid eighties, like I did, you'll find that the dancing they do is very different from what we do at Parrot's much slower. They do a completely kind of sighting, which they call historic sighting. And it's more social dancing, whereas what we do is exhibition dancing. We do it fast. We put the extra turns in, do a more dynamic kind of sighting rather than the historical sighting. So our tradition is its own living tradition, which we are adding to all the time when people write new Morris dances and new English country dances or put new tunes to the old dances because we're sick of that goddamn tune. <laughs> so we have a living, real tradition. So what you're describing is really just a new iteration of an oral tradition. Yeah, as one of my directors in court used to say, we are a chapter, not a page. Do you remember who said that? Oh, that was Tracy Zimmer that said that. But it's it's always been about the music for me, the, the Renaissance polyphony and the early instruments and just the tone and the chord structure. Just really visceral. I'm kind of running out of words here, so I'm going to give you my traditional final questions. The first is, when you were kind enough to say yes to be recorded, was the next thought of yours, oh, I have to be sure to mention so-and-so or this and such dance. So this is your time to give me your, oh yeah, I'm going to regret not saying this once he stops recording the answer. Well, that's why I started making notes. <laughs> After 1983, I left the fair for three years, tried my, to make my way in the real world, found that that was kind of a bust and the real world sucked. So I came back to the fair. 86, I came back and I did the fairs until about 1992 when I left the Bay Area. The rock and roll band I was playing with at the time and I, containing my future husband, pulled up stakes from the Bay Area and came here to Chico, California where we morphed into an acoustic band called Beltane and played up and down the state for several years. In 2008, I had a mini stroke, which left me somewhat disabled. And I decided it was time to go home. And that's when I brought my acoustic band Beltane to the Dickens Fair. And we did that for a couple of years, but we weren't getting really good audiences and I had been holding English country dance parties once a fair and the last one that I had held was so well attended everybody told me what a great time they had had and finally doing the light bulb went off that maybe I should be doing English country dance at the Dickens Fair and so in 2011 I started the Crown and Anchor English Country Dance Party. And our main focus was going to be teaching the public English Country Dance, like I used to do back at Black Point. And I started off with myself and my husband, who was also a very talented musician, and a small handful of dancers. And we just started teaching all the customers English Country Dance, and it grew year by year. And when I stopped after 2019, my husband died in 2018. He did that fair. We did Crown and Anchor that year. January, he was 
diagnosed with terminal cancer and that February he died. So 2019, I did that stick and spare without him. And everyone was so wonderful and so supportive. And then after that, COVID happened and everything stopped. And I had Christmas with my family. And it was really nice. And I didn't have to drive a 300-mile round trip, which was nice. And I decided that it was time to retire. I'm 66 and disabled. So I may go back and visit because, gosh, I miss everyone. And I'm so far from everyone here in Chico. But it's a long way. It's a long way. But I miss it. I found looking at the posts on Facebook this year that I, I, I was really feeling it. So maybe I'll go back and do a couple of weekends. We'll do an English country dance party a couple of weekends, maybe. We thought we'd be young forever, you know? I really think you've answered this next question. So now that we've gone through the whole interview process, is there anybody else you'd like to thank, think about, or acknowledge? Jay Simo was the first person I met outside of my little theater company bubble when I first came to the Renaissance Fair at the tender age of 14. He was, of course, doing street theater, pulled me into his street theater bit, and remained a friend all, all through these years. I was, I was so sad to hear that he passed. Love to you, Jay, wherever you are, buddy. Nope, I found another question that I should have asked. And oh, okay. I, again, this is, one is an improv. Say it's Thanksgiving. Say you're at the table with your extended family. Say you have a niece. Her name is Zoe. She's 14 years old. And in the midst of everybody eating mashed potatoes and trying not to talk about Donald Trump, she says, I want to work at the Renaissance Fair next spring. And then there's a pause in the conversation. And then Zoe says, look at Aunt Morgan and all the fine things that she did out at the fair. I want to go to fair and be just like Aunt Morgan. Your sister puts down her napkin very politely and then turns to you and says, yes, Morgan, why should the apple of my eye go to the Renaissance Fair at age 14? You put down your napkin and say, oh, well, at her mention of I want to work the Renaissance Fair and be just like Aunt Morgan, I, I, I would have start squeeing and crying and squealing about how, oh, I'll make you a costume. We got to get started right away. I have no more blood family left. The family that I have now, my best friend's family, who's also my landlady, and she worked a cookie cart at Black Point, so she'd be squeeing too. We'd be squeeing and jumping up and down and saying, oh, we'll make you a costume. Yeah, let's do this. We want to go too. That's a great answer. I would like to give you a counterfactual, which is to say, if you lived in a world that did not have a Renaissance fair, how do you think your life would have evolved? Oh my, with my very bad ADD, it, it could have been very bad. I wouldn't have the confidence I have today. I wouldn't have the performance chops I have. I wouldn't have the strong chosen family bonds that I have. Oh my, I would have been a mess without the fair. I would probably be dead now, honestly. Let me, let me push you a little on that and say, other than not being dead, um, <laughs> would you have like ended up working for the gas company in customer relations or? I couldn't have. I couldn't have. With my ADD, I would probably have ended up on SSI, honestly, and just been one of those sad people living on SSI because they just can't do anything else. I am so, so thankful for the Renaissance Fair and everything it brought to my life. 
Okay, this is also uh, a role play fantasy that okay. has a lot of assumptions behind it. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. You have just been awarded the highly coveted Phyllis Patterson Award for Lifetime Achievement in Fair Skills Applied to Life. The band has been told to sit on its hands and you have as much time as you like. Give me your acceptance speech. I would like to thank First of all, Phyllis Patterson for giving us this amazing playground to, to make all of our dreams happen in reality. I would like to thank every musician that I have ever worked with at the fair. I'd like to thank Carolyn Schultz, and Deborah Markert and Chris Seda and all the wonderful costumers, John Bird and the people at the props department. I am so grateful for all the life lessons that I have learned at the Renaissance Fair and all the people that I love because of the Renaissance Fair. And I just hope that everyone can find something like this in their lives to be so fulfilled and so joyful. Thank you. Well, that was perfect. Good job. Um, fair training, fair training. <laughs> comes through once again. And what's your note that you would like to add? Okay. When I talked about being uh, you know, a poor kid from the poor side, from the wrong side of the tracks, and that my mom bought me a mandolin because she couldn't afford a lute. In the 21st century, because of computer aided construction techniques, I have been able to purchase and start to learn to play an actual Elizabethan lute. So, yay! <laughs> it Would only you? like 800 bucks instead of $8,000. And I bought it with money from my mother's estate because I knew she wanted me to have And where can people hear you play this fine instrument, Morgan? You can hear my lute on the band camp work, uh, Portly Manners, Country Matters, where there's actually a whole bunch of songs from fair, there's a version of Barley Moe and uh, several English country dances, of course. And uh, yeah, check it out. You don't even have to buy it. Just go to band camp, find Courtly Manners, Country Matters and press play. Well, I think I'm going to stop recording now. Okay. That's where this stop recording button comes in so very handy. That's my January 2024 interview with Morgan McDowell. If you have questions or comments you'd like me to pass along to Morgan, you can send them to me at djng at earthlink.net. If you have questions or comments about the podcast itself, you can email me those at djng at earthlink.net. Finally, if you or somebody you know would like to be a guest on Fair Folk at Work, send me an email at djng at earthlink.net. Well, that's it for this time. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.